Thanks. Thank you. Wow, screaming. Thank you. That's so nice to hear screaming and hooting. I've never had that before. It's so great to be here at the 92nd Street Y. It's, I can't see it now because it's, it's, there's bright light in my eyes, but this is such a beautiful auditorium. And I was standing out here a minute ago, and I think they've reupholstered the seats. They look plush and green, and I wish I was sitting in one right now. Um, we're going to go old school tonight. I discussed it with Bernard. I, he said, who do you want to introduce you? And I said, let's, let's dispense with the intro introduction. If you don't know who I am, it doesn't really matter. You're here for some <laughs> unknown reason. Someone has taken you here. Maybe you like them. Maybe something's going to happen tonight. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll in any case forget who I am in that case. Um, otherwise, you, you maybe have some sense of, of what I might read or, or who I am. So we're going to dispense with that. I'm going to read a short story. The, I have this new book, Fresh Complaint. It's um, a collection of all the short stories that I've written and published in my life. It's kind of, an, kind of a strange book, almost a posthumous book, as though I, I died and my poor widow thought, the mortgage is sort of high. We've got to, what was, what was just lying around? We'll put, it, we'll put it together. So it has stories from 1989, my first, my first story I wrote in, in, uh, in graduate school. And it has some, some new work that no one's ever seen. And those stories tend to be rather long, 50 pages, 30 pages, too long um, to read tonight. So I'm going to read a, a, a story that um, came out in 1996, I think, in the Yale Review. So unless there are Yaleys here, probably no one has, has, has ever heard of this story. Um, and I, I, I thought it was the right, the right length and the, and the right tenor um, to, um, to do tonight. So that's what I'm going to do, just read the, an entire story. You'll get the beginning, the middle, and the end. It won't be like a novel reading where it, it was just some little excerpt and it didn't make sense. Hopefully this will at least make sense. It certainly will be complete. I can, I can guarantee that. It's the full thing. I'm reading every word. Um, <clears throat> and then I'm looking forward to the lights coming up and, and taking your, your questions. So this is called Airmail. Through the bamboo, Mitchell watched the German woman, his fellow invalid, making another trip to the outhouse. She came out under the porch of her hut, holding a hand over her eyes. It was murderously sunny out, while her other somnambulistic hand searched for the beach towel hanging over the railing. Finding it, she draped the towel loosely, only just extenuatingly, over her otherwise unclothed body and staggered out into the sun. She came right by Mitchell's hut, through the slats, her skin looked a sickly chicken soup color. She was wearing only one flip-flop. Every few steps, she had to stop and lift her bare foot out of the blazing sand. Then she rested, flamingo-style, breathing hard. She looked as if she might collapse, but she didn't. She made it across the sand to the edge of the scrubby jungle. When she reached the outhouse, she opened the door and peered into the darkness. Then she consigned herself to it. Mitchell dropped his head back to the floor. He was lying on a straw mat with a plaid L.L. Bean bathing suit for a pillow. It was cool in the hut, and he didn't want to get up himself. Unfortunately, his stomach was erupting. All night his insides had been quiet, but that morning Larry had persuaded him to eat an egg, and now the amoebas had something to feed on. I told you I didn't want an egg, he said now, and only then remembered that Larry wasn't there. Larry was off down the beach, partying with the Australians. So as not to get angry, Mitchell closed his eyes and took a series of deep breaths. Only after a few, the ringing started up. He listened, breathing in and out, trying to pay attention to nothing else. When the ringing got even louder, he rose on one elbow and searched for the letter he was writing to his parents, the most recent letter. He found it tucked into Ephesians in his pocket New Testament. The front of the aerogram was already covered with handwriting. Without bothering to reread what he'd written, he grabbed the ballpoint pen, wedged at the ready in the bamboo, and began. Do you remember my old English teacher, Mr. Dudar? 
When I was in 10th grade, he came down with cancer of the esophagus. It turned out he was a Christian scientist, which we never knew. He refused to have chemotherapy even. And guess what happened? Absolute and total remission. The tin door of the outhouse rattled shut and the German woman emerged into the sun again. Her towel had a wet stain. Mitchell put his letter down his letter and crawled to the door of his hut. As soon as he stuck out his head, he could feel the heat. The sky was the filtered blue of a souvenir postcard, the ocean one shade darker. The white sand was like a tanning reflector. He squinted at the silhouette, hobbling toward him. How you feeling? The German woman didn't answer until she reached a stripe of shade between the huts. She lifted her foot and scowled at it. When I go, it's just brown water. It'll go away. Just keep fasting. I'm fasting three days now. You have to starve the amoebas out. Yeah, but I think maybe the amoebas are starving me out. Except for the towel, she was still naked, but naked like a sick person. Mitchell didn't feel anything. She waved and started walking away. When she was gone, he crawled back into his hut and lay on the mat again. He picked up the pen and wrote, Mohandas K. Gandhi used to sleep with his grandnieces, one on either side, to test his vow of chastity, i.e., saints are always fanatics. He laid his head on the bathing suit and closed his eyes. In a moment, the ringing started again. It was interrupted sometime later by the floor shaking. The bamboo bounced under Mitchell's head and he sat up. In the doorway, his traveling companion's face hung like a harvest moon. Larry was wearing a Burmese lungi and an Indian silk scarf. His chest, hairier than you expected on a little guy, was bare and sunburned as pink as his face. His scarf had metallic gold and silver threads and was thrown dramatically over one shoulder. He was smoking a beady, half bent over, looking at Mitchell. Diarrhea update, he said. I'm fine. You're fine? I'm okay. Larry seemed disappointed. The pinkish, sunburned skin of his forehead wrinkled. He held up a small glass bottle. I brought you some pills for the shits. Pills plug you up, Mitchell said. Then the amoebas stay in you. Gwendolyn gave them to me. You should try them. Fasting would have worked by now. It's been, what, almost a week. Fasting doesn't include being force-fed eggs. One egg, said Larry, waving this away. I was all right before I ate that egg. Now my stomach hurts. I thought you said you were fine. I am fine, said Mitchell, and his stomach erupted. He felt a series of pops in his lower abdomen, followed by an easing as of liquid being siphoned off. Then, from his bowels, came the familiar, insistent pressure. He turned his head away, closing his eyes, and began to breathe deeply again. Larry took a few more drags on the beady and said, You don't look so good to me. You, said Mitchell, still with his eyes closed, are stoned. You betcha, was Larry's response. Which reminds me, we ran out of papers. He stepped over Mitchell and the array of aerograms, finished and unfinished, and the tiny New Testament, into his, that is, Larry's, half of the hut. He crouched and began searching through his bag. Larry's bag was made of a rainbow-colored burlap. So far, it had never passed through customs without being exhaustively searched. It was the kind of bag that announced, I am carrying drugs. Larry found his chillum, removed the stone bowl, and knocked out the ashes. Don't do that on the floor. Relax, they fall right through. Larry rubbed his fingers back and forth. See, all tidy. He put the chillum to his mouth to make sure that it was drawing. As he did so, he looked sideways at Mitchell. Do you think you'll be able to travel soon? I think so. Because we should probably be getting back to Bangkok, I mean, eventually. I'm up for Bali. You up? As soon as I'm up, said Mitchell. Larry nodded once, as though satisfied. He removed the chillum from his mouth and reinserted the beady. He stood hunching over beneath the roof and stared at the floor. The mailboat comes tomorrow. What? 
the mailboat for your letters. Larry pushed a few around with his foot. You want me to mail them for you? You have to go down to the beach. I can do it. I'll be up tomorrow. Larry raised one eyebrow but said nothing. Then he started for the door. I'll leave these pills in case you change your mind. As soon as he was gone, Mitchell got up. There was no putting it off any longer. He retied his lungi and stepped out onto the porch, covering his eyes. He kicked around for his flip-flops. Beyond, he was aware of the beach and the shuffling waves. He came down the steps and started walking. He didn't look up. He saw only his feet and the sand rolling past. The German woman's footprints were still visible, along with pieces of litter, shredded packages of Nescafe, or balled-up paper napkins that blew from the cook tent. He could smell fish grilling. It didn't make him hungry. The outhouse was a shack of corrugated tin. Outside sat a rusted oil drum of water in a small plastic bucket. Mitchell filled the bucket and took it inside. Before closing the door, while there was still light to see, he positioned his feet on the platform to either side of the hole. Then he closed the door, and everything became dark. He undid his lungi and pulled it up, hanging the fabric around his neck. Using Asian toilets had made him limber. He could squat for ten minutes without strain. As for the smell, he hardly noticed it anymore. He held the door closed so that no one would barge in on him. The sheer volume of liquid that rushed out of him still surprised him, but it always came as a relief. He imagined the amoebas being swept away in the flood, swirling down the drain of himself and out of his body. The dysentery had made him intimate with his insides. He had a clear sense of his stomach, of his colon. He felt the smooth, muscular piping that constituted him. The combustion began high in his intestines. Then it worked its way along like an egg swallowed by a snake, expanding, stretching the tissue until, with a series of shudders, it dropped and he exploded into water. <laughs> He'd been sick, not for a week, but for 13 days. He hadn't said anything to Larry at first. One morning in a guest house in Bangkok, Mitchell had awoken with a queasy stomach. Once up and out of his mosquito netting, though, he'd felt better. Then that night after dinner, there'd come a series of taps, like fingers drumming on the inside of his abdomen. The next morning, the diarrhea started. That was no big deal. He'd had it before in India, but it had gone away after a few days. This didn't. Instead, it got worse, sending him to the bathroom a few times after every meal. Soon he started to feel fatigued. He got dizzy when he stood up. His stomach burned after eating. But he kept on traveling. He didn't think it was anything serious. From Bangkok, he and Larry took a bus to the coast, where they boarded a ferry to the island. The boat puttered into the small cove, shutting off its engine in the shallow water. They had to wade to shore, just that, jumping in had confirmed something. The sloshing of the sea mimicked the sloshing in Mitchell's gut. As soon as they got settled, Mitchell had begun to fast. For a week now, he consumed nothing but black tea, leaving the hut only for the outhouse. Coming out one day, he'd run into the German woman and had persuaded her to start fasting too. Otherwise, he lay on his mat, thinking and writing letters home. Greetings from paradise. Larry and I are currently staying on a tropical island in the Gulf of Siam. Check the world atlas. We have our own hut right on the beach for which we pay the princely sum of $5 per night. This island hasn't been discovered yet, so there's almost nobody here. He went on, describing the island or as much as he could glimpse through the bamboo, but soon returned to more important preoccupations. Eastern religion teaches that all matter is illusory. That includes everything, our house, every one of dad's suits, even mom's plant hangers, all maya, according to the Buddha. That category also includes, of course, the body. One of the reasons I decided to take this grand tour was that our frame of reference back in Detroit seemed a little cramped. And there are a few things I've come to believe in and to test. 
one of which is that we can control our bodies with our minds. They have monks in Tibet who can mentally regulate their physiologies. They play a game called melting snowballs. They put a snowball in one hand and then meditate, sending all their internal heat to that hand. The one who melts the snowball fastest wins. From time to time, he stopped writing to sit with his eyes closed as though waiting for inspiration. And that was exactly how he'd been sitting two months earlier, eyes closed, spine straight, head lifted, nose somehow alert, when the ringing started. It had happened in a pale green Indian hotel room in Malahalabalipuram. Mitchell had been sitting on his bed in the half lotus position. His inflexible left western knee stuck way up in the air. Larry was off exploring the streets. Mitchell was alone. He hadn't even been waiting for anything to happen. He was just sitting there trying to meditate, his mind wandering to all sorts of things. For instance, he was thinking about his old girlfriend, Christine Woodhouse, and her amazing red pubic hair, which he'd never get to see again. He was thinking about food. He was hoping they had something in this town besides idli sambar. Every so often, he'd become aware of how much his mind was wandering, and then he'd try to direct it back to his breathing. Then, sometimes in the middle of all this, when he least expected it, when he'd stopped even trying or waiting for anything to happen, which was exactly when all the mystics said it would happen, Mitchell's ears had begun to ring very softly. It wasn't an unfamiliar ringing. In fact, he recognized it. He could remember standing in the front yard one day as a little kid and suddenly hearing this ringing in his ears and asking his older brothers, do you hear that ringing? They said they didn't, but they knew what he was talking about. In the pale green hotel room, after almost 20 years, Mitchell heard it again. He thought maybe this ringing was what they meant by the cosmic ohm or the music of the spheres. He kept trying to hear it after that. Wherever he went, he listened for the ringing, and after a while, he got pretty good at hearing it. He heard it in the middle of Sutter Street in Calcutta with cabs honking and street urchins shouting for bakshish. He heard it on the train up to Chiang Mai. It was the sound of the universal energy, of all the atoms linking up to create the colors before his eyes. It had been right there the whole time. All he had to do was wake up and listen to it. He wrote home, at first tentatively, then with growing confidence about what was happening to him. The energy flow of the universe is capable of being apercepted. We are, each of us, finely tuned radios. We just have to blow the dust off our tubes. He sent his parents a few letters each week. He sent letters to his brothers, too, and to his friends. Whatever he was thinking, he wrote down. He didn't consider people's reactions. He was seized by a need to analyze his intuitions, to describe what he saw and felt. Dear Mom and Dad, I watched a woman being cremated this afternoon. You can tell if it's a woman by the color of the shroud. Hers was red. It burned off first. Then her skin did. While I was watching, her intestines filled up with hot gas, like a great big balloon. They got bigger and bigger until they finally popped. Then all this fluid came out. I tried to find something similar on a postcard for you, but no such luck. <laughs> or else, dear Petey, does it ever occur to you that this world of earwax remover and embarrassing jock itch might not be the whole Megillah? Sometimes it looks that way to me. Blake believed in angelic recitation, and who knows, his poems back him up. Sometimes at night, when the moon gets that very pale thing going, I swear I feel a flutter of wings against the three-day growth on my cheeks. Mitchell had called home only once from Calcutta. The connection had been bad. It was the first time Mitchell and his parents had experienced the transatlantic delay. His father answered. Mitchell said hello, hearing nothing until the, his last syllable, the O, echoed in his ears. After that, the static changed registers, and his father's voice came through. Traveling over half the globe, it lost some of its characteristic force. Now listen, your mother and I want you to get on a plane and get yourself back home. 
I just got to India. You've been gone six months. That's long enough. We don't care what it costs. Use that credit card we gave you and buy yourself a ticket back home. I'll be home in two months or so. What the hell are you doing over there? His father shouted as best he could against the satellite. What is this about dead bodies in the Ganges? You're liable to come down with some disease. No, I won't. I feel fine. Well, your mother doesn't feel fine. She's worried half to death. Dad, this is the best part of the trip so far. Europe was great and everything, but it's still the West. And what's wrong with the West? Nothing, only it's more exciting to get away from your own culture. Speak to your mother, his father said. And then his mother's voice, almost a whimper, had come over the line. Mitchell, are you okay? I'm fine. We're worried about you. Don't worry. I'm fine. You don't sound right in your letters. What's going on with you? Mitchell wondered if he could tell her. But there was no way to say it. You couldn't say, I've found the truth. People didn't like that. You sound like one of those Hare Krishnas. <laughs> I haven't joined up yet, Mom. So far, all I've done is shave my head. You shaved your head, Mitchell? No, he told her, though, in fact, it was true. <laughs> he had shaved his head. Then his father was back on the line. His voice was strictly business now, a gutter voice Mitchell hadn't heard before. Listen, stop cocking around over there in India and get your butt back home. Six months is enough traveling. We gave you that credit card for emergencies, and we want you... Just then, a divine stroke... The line had gone dead. <laughs> Mitchell had been left holding the receiver with a queue of Bengalis waiting behind him. He decided to let them have their turns. He hung up the receiver, thinking that he shouldn't call home again. They couldn't possibly understand what he was going through or what this marvelous place had taught him. He'd toned down his letters, too. From now on, he'd stick to scenery. But of course he hadn't. No more than five days had passed before he was riding home again, describing the incorruptible body of St. Francis Xavier and how it had been carried through the streets of Goa for 400 years until an overzealous pilgrim had bitten off the saint's finger. Mitchell couldn't help himself. Everything he saw, the fantastical banyan trees, the painted cows, made him start writing, and after he described the sights, he talked about their effect on him, and from the colors of the visible world, he moved straight away into the darkness and the ringing of the invisible. When he got sick, he'd written home about that too. Dear Mom and Dad, I think I have a touch of amoebic dysentery. He'd gone on to describe the symptoms, the remedies the other travelers used. Everybody gets it sooner or later. I'm just going to fast and meditate until I get better. I've lost a little weight, but not much. Soon as I'm better, Larry and I are off to Bali. He was right about one thing. Sooner or later, everybody did get it. Besides the German, their, his German neighbor, two other travelers on the island had been suffering from stomach complaints. One, a Frenchman, laid low by a salad, had taken to his hut from which he'd groaned and called for help like a dying emperor. But just yesterday, Mitchell had seen him restored to health, rising out of the shallow bay with a parrotfish impaled on the end of his spear gun. The other victim had been a Swedish woman. Mitchell had last seen her being carried out, limp and exhausted, to the ferry. The Thai boatman had pulled her aboard with the empty soda bottles and fuel containers. They were used to the sight of languishing foreigners. As soon as they'd stowed the woman on deck, they'd started smiling and waving. Then the boat had kicked into reverse, taking the woman back to the clinic on the mainland. If it came to that, Mitchell knew he could always be evacuated. He didn't, however, expect it to come to that. Once he'd gotten the egg out of his system, he felt better. The pain in his stomach went away. Four or five times a day, he had Larry bring him black tea. He refused to give the amoeba so much as a drop of milk to feed on. Contrary to what he would have, would have expected, his mental energy didn't diminish, but actually increased. It's incredible how much energy is taken up with the act of digestion, he wrote. Rather than being some weird penance, fasting is actually a very sane and scientific method of quieting the body, of turning the body off. And when the body turns off, the mind turns on. 
The Sanskrit for this is moksha, which means total liberation from the body. The strange thing was that here in the hut, verifiably sick, Mitchell had never felt so good, so tranquil, or so brilliant in his life. He felt secure and watched over in a way he couldn't explain. He felt happy. This wasn't the case with the German woman. She looked worse and worse. She hardly spoke when they passed now. Her skin was paler, splotchier. After a while, Mitchell stopped encouraging her to keep fasting. He lay on his back with the bathing suit over his eyes now and paid no attentions to her trips to the outhouse. He listened instead to the sounds of the island, people swimming and shouting on the beach, somebody learning to play a wooden flute a few huts down. Waves lapped, and occasionally a dead palm leaf or coconut fell to the ground. At night, the wild dogs began howling in the jungle. When he went to the outhouse, Mitchell could hear them moving around outside, coming up and sniffing him, the flow of his waist through the holes in the walls. Most people banged flashlights against the tin door to scare the dogs away. Mitchell didn't even bring a flashlight along. He stood listening to the dogs gather in the vegetation. With sharp muzzles, they pushed stalks aside until their red eyes appeared in the moonlight. Mitchell faced them down serenely. He spread out his arms, offering himself, and when they didn't attack, he turned and walked back to his hut. One night, as he was coming back, he heard an Australian voice say, Here comes the patient now. He looked up to see Larry and an older woman sitting on the porch of the hut. Larry was rolling a joint on his Let's Go Asia. The woman was smoking a cigarette and looking straight at Mitchell. Hello, Mitchell. I'm Gwendolyn, she said. I hear you've been sick. Somewhat. Larry says you haven't been taking the pills I sent over. Mitchell didn't answer right away. He hadn't talked to another human being all day or for a couple of days. He had to get reacclimated. Solitude had sensitized him to the roughness of other people. Gwendolyn's loud whiskey baritone, for instance, seemed to rake right across his chest. She was wearing some kind of batik headdress that looked like a bandage. Lots of tribal jewelry, too, bones and shells hanging around her neck and from her wrists. In the middle of all this was her pinched, oversunned face with the red coil of the cigarette in the center blinking on and off. Larry was just a halo of blonde hair in the moonlight. I had a terrible case of the trots myself, Gwendolyn continued. Truly epic, in Irian Jaya. Those pills were a godsend. Larry finished, gave a finishing lick to the joint and lit it. He inhaled, looking up at Mitchell, then said in a smoke-tightened voice, We're here to make sure you take your medicine. That's right. Fasting is all well and good, but after... What has it been? Two weeks almost. After two weeks, it's time to stop. She looked stern, but then the joint came her way, and she said, oh, lovely. <laughs> she took a hit, held it, smiled at both of them, and then launched into a fit of coughing. It went on for about 30 seconds. Finally, she drank some beer, holding her hand over her chest. Then she resumed smoking her cigarette. Mitchell was looking at a big stripe of moon on the ocean. Suddenly he said, you just got divorced, is why you're taking this trip. Gwendolyn stiffened. Almost right. Not divorced, but separated. Is it that obvious? You're a hairdresser, Mitchell said, still looking out to sea. You didn't tell me your friend was a clairvoyant, Larry. I must have told him. Did I tell you? Mitchell didn't answer. Well, Mr. Nostradamus, I have a prediction for you. If you don't take those pills right now, you are going to be hauled away on the ferry one very sick boy. You don't want that, do you? Mitchell looked into Gwendolyn's eyes for the first time. He was struck by the irony. She thought he was the sick one, whereas it looked to him the other way around. Already she was lighting another cigarette, she was 43 years old, getting stoned on an island off the coast of Thailand while wearing a piece of coral reef in each earlobe. Her unhappiness rose off her like a wind. 
It wasn't that he was clairvoyant. It was just obvious. She looked away. Larry, where are my pills now? Inside the hut. Could you get them for me? Larry turned on his flashlight and bent through the doorway. The beam crossed the floor. You still haven't mailed your letters. I forgot. As soon as I finish them, I feel like I've sent them already. Larry reappeared with the bottle of pills and announced, It's starting to smell in there. He handled the bo handed the bottle to Gwendolyn. All right, you stubborn man, open up. She held out a pill. That's okay, really. I'm fine. Take your medicine, Gwendolyn said. Come on, Mitch. You look like shit. Do it. Take a goddamn pill. For a moment, there was silence as they stared at him. Mitchell wanted to explain his position, but it was pretty obvious that no amount of explanation would convince them that what he was doing made any sense. Everything he thought to say didn't quite cover it. Everything he thought to say cheapened how he felt, so he decided on the course of least resistance. He opened his mouth. Your tongue is bright yellow, Gwendolyn said. I've never seen such a yellow except on a bird. Go on, wash it down with a little beer. She handed him her bottle. Bravo, now take these four times a day for a week. Larry, I'm leaving you in charge of seeing that he does it. I think I need to go to sleep now, Mitchell said. All right, said Gwendolyn. We'll move the party down to my hut. When they were gone, Mitchell crawled back inside and lay down. Without otherwise moving, he spat out the pill, which he'd kept under his tongue. It clattered against the bamboo, then fell through to the sand underneath, just like Jack Nicholson in Cuckoo's Nest, he thought, smiling to himself, but was too genuinely exhausted to write it down. With the bathing suit over his eyes, the days were more perfect, more obliterated. He slept in snatches whenever he felt like it and stopped paying attention to time. The rhythms of the island reached him, the sleep-thickened voices of people breakfasting on banana pancakes and coffee, later shouts on the beach, and in the evenings, the grill smoking and the Chinese cook scraping her walk with a long metal spatula. Beer bottles popped open, the cook tent filled with voices, then the various small parties bloomed in neighboring huts. At some point, Larry would come back smelling of beer, smoke, and suntan lotion. Mitchell would pretend to be asleep. Sometimes he was awake all night while Larry slept. Through his back, he could feel the floor, then the island itself, then the circulation of the ocean. The moon became full and, on rising, lit up the hut. Mitchell got up and walked down to the silver edge of the water. He waded out and floated on his back, staring up at the moon and the stars. The bay was a warm bath. The island floated in it, too. He closed his eyes and concentrated on his breathing. After a while, he felt all sense of outside and inside disappearing. He wasn't breathing so much as being breathed. The state would only last a few seconds. Then he'd come out. Then he'd get it again. His skin began to taste of salt. The wind carried it through the bamboo, coating him as he lay on his back or blew over him as he made his way to the outhouse. While he squatted, he sucked the salt from his bare shoulders. It was his only food. Sometimes he had an urge to go into the cook tent and order an entire grilled fish or a stack of pancakes, but stabs of hunger were rare, and in their wake he felt only a deeper, more complete peace. The floods continued to rush out of him, with less violence now but rawly, as though from a wound. He opened the drum and filled the water bucket, washed himself with his left hand. A few times he fell asleep, crouching over the hole, and came awake only when someone knocked on the metal door. He wrote more letters. Did I ever tell you about the leper mother and son I saw in Bangalore? I was coming down this street, and there they were, crouching by the curb. I was pretty used to seeing lepers by this point, but not ones like this. They were almost all the way gone. Their fingers weren't even stubs anymore. Their hands were just balls at the ends of their arms, and their faces were sliding off as if they were made of wax and were melting. The mother's left eye was all flinty and gray and stared up at the sky, but when I gave her 50 paisa, 
She looked at me with her good eye, and it was full of intelligence. She touched her arm knobs together to thank me. Right then my coin hit the cup, and her son, who couldn't see, said, Acha. He smiled, I think, though it was hard to tell because of his disfigurement. But what happened right then was this. I saw that they were people, not beggars or unfortunates, just a mother and her kid. I could see them back before they got leprosy, back when they used to just go out for a walk. And then I had another revelation. I had a hunch that the kid was a nut from Mango Lassie. And this seemed a very profound revelation to me at the time. It was a big revelation as I think I ever need or deserve. When my coin hit the cup and the boy said, Acha, I just knew he was thinking about a nice cold mango lassie. Mitchell put down his pen, remembering. Then he went outside to watch the sunset. He sat on the porch, cross-legged, his left knee no longer stuck up. When he closed his eyes, the ringing began at once louder, more intimate, more ravishing than ever. So much seemed funny, viewed from this distance. His worries about choosing a major, his refusal to leave his dorm room when afflicted with glaring facial pimples, even the searing despair of the time he'd called Christine Woodhouse's room and she hadn't come in all night was sort of funny now. You could waste your life he had, pretty much, until the day he'd boarded that airplane with Larry, inoculated against typhus and cholera, and had escaped. Only now, with no one watching, could Mitchell find out who he was. It was as though riding in all those buses, over all those bumps, had dislodged his old self bit by bit, so that it just rose up one day and vaporized into the Indian air. He didn't want to go back to the world of college and clove cigarettes. He was lying on his back, waiting for the moment when the body touched against enlightenment, or when nothing happened at all, which would be the same thing. Meanwhile, next door, the German woman was on the move again. Mitchell heard her rustling around. She came down her steps, but instead of heading for the outhouse, she climbed the steps to Mitchell's hut. He removed the bathing suit from his eyes. I'm going to the clinic in the boat. I figured you might. I'm going to get an injection. Stay one night, then come back. She paused a moment. You want to come with me? Get an injection? No thanks. Why not? Because I'm better. I'm feeling a lot better. Come to the clinic to be safe. We'll go together. I'm fine. He stood up, smiling, to indicate this. Out in the bay, the boat blew its horn. Mitchell came out onto the porch to send her off. I'll see you when you get back, he said. The German woman waded out to the boat and climbed aboard. She stood on deck, not waving, but looking in his direction. Mitchell watched her recede, growing smaller and smaller. When she disappeared at last, he realized he'd been telling the truth. He was better. His stomach was quiet. He put a hand over his belly as though to register what was inside. His stomach felt hollowed out, and he wasn't dizzy anymore. He had to find a whole new aerogram, and in the light from the sunset, he wrote, On this day, and I think November, I would like to announce that the gastrointestinal system of Mitchell B. Grammaticus has hereby been cured by spiritually, purely spiritual means. I want especially to thank my greatest supporter, who stuck with me through it all, Mary Baker Eddy. The next solid shit I take is really for her. He was still writing when Larry came in. Wow, you're awake. I'm better. You are? And guess what else? What? Mitchell put down his pen and gave Larry a big smile. I'm really hungry. Everyone on the island had heard about Mitchell, Mitchell's Gandhian fast by this point. His arrival in the cook tent brought applause and cheers. Also gasps from some of the women who couldn't bear to see how skinny he was. They all got maternal and made him sit down and felt his forehead for lingering fever. The tent was full of picnic tables, the counters stacked with pineapples and watermelons, beans, onions, potatoes, and lettuce. Long blue fish lay on chopping blocks. Coffee thermoses lined one wall full of hot water or tea. And in the back was another room containing a crib and the Chinese cook's baby. 
Mitchell looked around at all the new faces. The dirt under the picnic table felt surprisingly cool against his bare feet. The medical advice started up right away. Most people had fasted for a day or two during their Asian travels, after which they'd gone back to eating full meals. But Mitchell's fast had been so prolonged that one American traveler, a former medical student, said it was dangerous for Mitchell to eat too much too quickly. He advised having only liquids at first. The Chinese cook scoffed at this idea. After taking one look at Mitchell, she sent out a sea bass, a plate of fried rice, and an onion omelet. Most everyone else advocated pure gluttony, too. Mitchell struck a compromise. First, he drank a glass of papaya juice. He waited a few minutes and then began slowly to eat the fried rice. After that, still feeling fine, he moved cautiously to the sea bass. After every few bites, the former medical student said, okay, that's enough. But this was greeted by a chorus of other people saying, look at him, he's a skeleton, go on, eat, eat. It was nice to be around people again. Mitchell hadn't become quite as ascetic as he'd thought. He missed socializing. All the girls were wearing sarongs. They had truly accomplished suntans and fetching accents. They kept touching Mitchell, patting his ribs or encircling his wrists with their fingers. I'd die for cheekbones like yours, one girl said. Then she made him eat some fried bananas. Night fell. Somebody announced a party in hut number six. Before Mitchell knew what was happening, two Dutch girls were escorting him down the beach. They waited tables in Amsterdam five months of the year and spent the rest traveling. Apparently, Mitchell looked exactly like a von Hanthorst Christ in the Rijksmuseum. The Dutch girls found the resemblance both awe-inspiring and hilarious. Mitchell wondered if he'd made a mistake by staying in the hut so much. A kind of tribal life had sprouted up here on the island. No wonder Larry had been having such a good time. Everyone was so friendly. It wasn't even sexual so much as just warm and intimate. One of the Dutch girls had a nasty rash on her back. She turned around to show him. The moon was rising over the bay, casting a long swath of light to shore. It lit up the trunks of palm trees and gave the sand a lunar phosphorescence. Everything had a bluish tint except for the orange glowing huts. Mitchell felt the air rinsing his face and flowing through his legs as he walked behind Larry. There was a lightness inside him, a helium balloon around his heart. There was nothing a person needed beyond this beach. He called out, Hey, Larry. What? We've gone everywhere, man. Not everywhere. Next stop, Bali. Then home. After Bali, home. Before my parents have a nervous breakdown. He stopped walking and held the Dutch girl's back. He thought he'd heard the ringing, louder than ever but then realized that it was just the music coming from hut number six. Right out front, people were sitting in a circle in the sand. They made room for Mitchell and the new arrivals. What do you say, doctor? Can we give him a beer? Very funny, the medical student said. I suggest one, no more. <laughs> in due course, the beer was passed along the fire brigade and into Mitchell's hands. Then the person to Mitchell's right put her hand on his knee. It was Gwendolyn. He hadn't recognized her in the darkness. She took a long drag on her cigarette. She turned her face away to exhale primarily, but also with a suggestion of hurt feelings and said, you haven't thanked me. For what? For the pills. Oh, right. That was really thoughtful of you. She smiled for a few seconds and then started coughing. It was a smoker's cough, deep-seated and guttural. She tried to suppress it by leaning forward and covering her mouth, but the coughing only grew more violent, as if ripping holes in her lungs. When it finally subsided, Gwendolyn wiped her eyes. Oh, I'm dying. She looked around the circle of people. Everyone was talking and laughing. Nobody cares. All this time, Mitchell had been examining Gwendolyn closely. It seemed clear to him that if she didn't have cancer already, she was going to get it soon. You want to know how I knew you were separated, he said. Well, I think I might. It's because of this glow you have. Women who get divorced or separated always have this glow. I've noticed it before. It's 
It's like they get younger. Really? Yes, indeed, said Mitchell. Gwendolyn smiled. I am feeling rather restored. Mitchell held out his beer and they clinked bottles. Cheers, she said. Cheers. He took a sip of beer. It tasted like the best beer he'd ever had. He felt ecstatically happy suddenly. They weren't sitting around a campfire, but they were, it felt like everyone was glowing and centrally warmed. Mitchell squinted at the different faces in the circle and then looked out at the bay. He was thinking about his trip. He tried to remember all the places he and Larry had gone, the smelly pensions, the Baroque cities, the hill stations. If he didn't think about any single place, he could sense them all, kaleidoscopically shifting around inside his head. He felt complete and satisfied. At some point, the ringing had started up again. He was concentrating on that, too, so that at first he didn't notice the twinge in his intestines. Then from far off, piercing his consciousness, came another twinge, still so delicate that he might have imagined it. In another moment, it came again, more insistently. He felt a valve open inside him, and a trickle of hot liquid like acid begin burning its way toward the outside. He wasn't alarmed. He felt too good. He just stood up again and said, I'm going down to the water a minute. I'll go with you, said Larry. The moon was higher now. As they approached, it lit the bay up like a mirror. Away from the music, Mitchell could hear the wild dogs barking in the jungle. He led Larry straight down to the water's edge. Then, without pausing, he let his lungy drop and stepped out of it. He waded into the sea. Skinny dip? Mitchell didn't answer. What's the water temp? Cold, said Mitchell. Though this wasn't true, the water was warm. It was just that he wanted to be alone in it. He waded out until the water was waist deep. Cupping both hands, he sprinkled water over his face. Then he dropped into the water and began to float on his back. His ears plugged up. He heard water rushing, then the silence of the sea, then the ringing again. It was clearer than ever. It wasn't a ringing so much as a beacon penetrating his body. He lifted his head and said, Larry, what? Thanks for taking care of me. No problem. Now that he was in the water, he felt better again. He sensed the pull of the tide out in the bay, retreating with the night wind and the rising moon. A small hot stream came out of him, and he paddled away from it and continued to float. He stared up at the sky. He didn't have his pen or aerograms with him, so he began to dictate silently, Dear Mom and Dad, the earth itself is all the evidence we need. Its rhythms, its perpetual regeneration, the rising and falling of the moon, the tide flowing into land or out again to sea, all this is a lesson for that very slow learner, the human race. The earth keeps repeating the drill over and over until we get it right. Nobody would believe this place, Larry said on the beach. It's a total fucking paradise. The ringing grew louder. A minute passed, or a few minutes. Finally, he heard Larry say, Hey, Mitch, I'm going back to the party now. You okay? He sounded far away. Mitchell stretched out his arms, which allowed him to float a little higher in the water. He couldn't tell if Larry had gone or not. He was looking at the moon. He'd begun to notice something about the moon that he'd never noticed before. He could make out the wavelengths of the moonlight. He'd managed to slow his mind down enough to perceive that. The moonlight would speed up a second, growing brighter, then it would slow down, becoming dim. It pulsed. The moonlight was a kind of ringing itself. He lay undulating in the warm water, observing the correspondence of moonlight and ringing, how they increased together, diminished together. After a while, he began to be aware that he too was like that. His blood pulsed with the moonlight, with the ringing. Something was coming out of him far away. He felt his insides emptying out. The sensation of water leaving him was no longer painful or explosive. It had become a steady flow of his essence into nature. In the next second, Mitchell felt as though he were dropping through the water. 
and then he had no sense of himself at all. He wasn't the one looking at the moon or hearing the ringing, and yet he was aware of them. For a moment, he thought he should send word to his parents to tell them not to worry. He'd found the paradise beyond the island. He was trying to gather himself to dictate this last message, but soon he realized that there was nothing left of him to do it, nothing at all. No person left to hold a pen or to send word to the people he loved who would never understand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, as the lights come up, and we have microphones on either side, and the, uh, what we need is at least one intrepid person to come and ask a question, and then after that, it'll get easier. People are standing up. Who knows why? <laughs> people, people who have their emodium with them are, are thinking about going to the pharmacy. Right about now. Ah, oh, hello. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Um, my name is Heather. Um, I hold you in the highest regard, and I really enjoy your fiction. Um, that being said, uh, <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. That's all right. Yeah. Um, what's in it for you? Like, oh. why do you write? Like, other than like, you have a Pulitzer, so it might seem like a stupid question. Mm. But like, deep down, like at the end of the day, like when, like, why do you write? It's a, it's a, it's a. How does it fulfill? It's an answer. It's a question I get asked a lot, and I never know how to answer because I've been doing it so long. Like like a horse at a stable that just keeps going around and around and is used to doing it. I just get up and I, I do it. It seems to me that I'm always excited when I wake up in the morning that I, that I get to write and try to get whatever I'm working on to, to work. It's a, a way of, for me, being living at a maximum intensity in my memory about what's happened to me and what I can invent. Um, I'm the kind of person who sometimes doesn't really feel as though I'm living or understanding my life or attaining any clarity to my life unless I'm removed from life trying to describe it. It's a strange, it's a strange way to live, but it's become habitual to me. Um, and it's, it's just what makes me feel happy, this, the simplest thing I can, can say. I started doing it when I was young because I enjoyed it um, and I wanted to get better at it. I, you know, I admired a lot of writers and I, I wanted, you know, I, I wanted to do something like, like they did. And uh, little by little, I had kind of given up that ambition because I just was um, so involved in the process of it. It's a little bit like playing, um, I was talking to the students earlier today from um, Queens and, and Riverdale, I think. And um, for, for me, it, it's a little bit like working at a puzzle or, or playing a video game, something that really involves me and, I, and diverts me and that I can't quite win at, you know, and I keep trying to get to a different level. So that's why I do it. It's, it's, um, it's, it's a way of being alive and being attentive to my own life and making sense of it because it, it rushes by in, in a blur. I, I don't have um, social or political goals in, in writing, but I think that if you describe the things you've seen or the places you've grown up with, those things come into the work necessarily without, without your thinking about it. So I have been surprised sometimes at the, um, the actual palpable effects that my work ha have, has had on people or, or um, even you know, social, social questions, but I never think about that. I never say, get up in the morning and I'm going to do this f you know, to, to right or wrong. I mean, it, it would seem a very impotent way of going about that. Um, but I'm sometimes pleased to see that it, it does happen nevertheless. But mainly I'm just trying to describe 
what it's like to be alive and to be, be me and to be some of the people I've met in my life. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm hoping that you can speak a little bit about the evolution of characters like um, Mitchell or Dr. Luce from short stories into novels um, and how they sort of grow yeah. or don't grow from one form to the other. Right. Yeah, there's two characters in this book that appeared in, in novels. Um, the, the, the character, one of the three main characters in the marriage plot is Mitchell Grammaticus. And when I was putting this book together, or when my widow was putting it together, she noticed, she noticed that there was a character named Mitchell, but his name was Mitchell Carambolis in the original story. But he seemed to be the same guy. He had the first name, he was on a trip, he was in college, many of the things linked up. So I thought, oh, I forgot that I've already written about Mitchell. He's here, and this is him too, so I tidied up. It was the only change I made, um, substantive change to the, to the stories um, in, in republishing them was to make him Mitchell. So um, he's an alter ego for me, and that's why he's you know reappearing um, in my novels. Um, whenever I write close to my own memories and my own experience, which I don't do that often, it's usually from the point of view of, of Mitchell, or, or you know, so far it has been. Dr. Luce, um, when I first was writing Middlesex, my, my editor Jonathan Galassi is here, and he can attest to this. I had two versions of the novel, both about 150 pages long. One was written in the first person, and one was written in the third person. The third person version had lots of different characters, and the point of view changed with each section. And there was a section about Dr. Luce, who's a sexologist, going to Papua New Guinea to investigate a tribe where they have a third gender category. So it was a way of dealing with many of the issues in Middlesex from the point of view of a, of a, a physician studying it and doing some anthropological work. Um, when I finally decided to, um, with the help of, 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 of Jonathan and other people, to trash that, that version of the book or to set it aside because the first, ver first person version um, was, was, was probably going to be a book that would actually turn into a book and the other one was maybe a, a little bit out of control. Um, that, you know, that whole set, that whole, all those 150 pages were useless to me. I had to throw them out, um, which was fine because I, I did have 150 of the, of the pages I was using. It just so happened at that moment, the New Yorker put out their 20 writers under 40 issue in which I was um, included and they needed some fiction to publish in the magazine right away. And I had nothing finished and nothing new except for this 150 pages of the, of the discarded book. So that story, The Arachid Revolva, is really an outtake from the abandoned novel. It's the only story in this collection that I don't consider an actual proper short story. It is a little bit more excerpty than, than the others. Um, he is an important character. He is in Middlesex, as you say. Um, and I, I managed to get a lot of the information about his, his theories, which are discredited um, by the novel, in, into the novel through the narration of Cal, who, who tells the whole story. I ended up with a narrator who, had, who was first person, but was endowed with certain third person um, powers to, to tell his tale. Um, that, that arose out of his, his own psychology. So in a sense, I had to write that whole 150 pages in the third person in order to pilfer, pilfer from it and, and realize that I needed to combine it. The book is about a, a hybrid. It's about someone who's been both male and female. Why shouldn't the narrative point of view also be a little bit strange in a first person that's also a third person? But that's the way I write. That's how I come to my decisions through trial and error, mostly error, unfortunately, and then suddenly I'll, I'll figure it out. So that's, that's why they exist in those other forms. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for being here with uh, us tonight. My pleasure. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit about what the process was like going back and looking at pieces that you wrote when you were much younger um, and deciding to publish those, because I feel like we all look back at yeah. decisions we made when we were younger and we're like, oh, why did I do that, right. writer or not? So I can imagine looking at those pieces and deciding to publish them. It, 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 was, a little, it was a little bit like reading uh, your diary, going back and, and remembering what state you were in at a certain time, 
there were moments, fortunately, I had published all of these stories, so they weren't the ones that I've disc, you know, th thrown away. So I, I remembered them, I knew what they were. Um, so it, it wasn't like I was embarrassed um, finding the early ones, but sometimes there was a, a, both a recognition and, and an unrecognition that would happen. I remembered writing the story, I remembered who I was reading at the time and the influences I was laboring under. The earliest story is Capricious Gardens from um, the Gettysburg Review. And I was reading a lot of Milan Kundera and he, was, and re and he loved Diderot. And I was reading a lot of Diderot and reading a lot of Eastern European writers. And they had a, a sort of playful, um, omniscient quality to their narration that the characters are treated in a slightly wicked way as though they're not, not real, as though they're figments of your imagination and you're not really going to pretend otherwise. And you use them in almost an essay-like essay or analytical fashion. So I was, I was thinking about those things and that story has, a, has an atmosphere like that, has an, a quality, a kind of an 18th century quality to it, like, a, like an 18th century farce. So I, I, that's what I will remember when I look back. And then I'll see that later on I started to take my characters you know, extremely seriously and was no longer um, prone to making fun of them in, in, in any way or thinking that they, they weren't real. I wanted to try to go deeper with, with their psychology. Um, so it, it just changed as I, as I got older. So that's, that's what I noticed looking back. Um, there are some surprises. There's a story called Timeshare which is autobiographical and talks about my, my father's um, business difficulties late in life. My father was born in Detroit um, to immigrant parents from, from Asia Minor, grew up with not a lot of money. Then he did well as a businessman, made a lot of money, and then he lost all his money in his, in his 60s. And he made a last stand in, in Florida trying to turn a motel into a timeshare when timeshares were kind of a new thing. Um, and I had always thought of that story as maybe simple. Um, it's too, you know, for me, it's too autobiographical. I didn't do anything to it to, to estrange it or, or make, you know, soup it up in any way. It was just how I felt about my father and what happened to my father. And for some reason, I distrusted that in my memory. So I needed to do something more to it. But as I looked back at it, I was surprised that the simplicity was actually exactly what that story needed, and it was, it was fine. It was one of the stories that I wrote more easily, and I was worried what I would encounter there, and, but I was, I was pleasantly surprised by it. So different things happen, I, and my mood is always shifting around, but um, it's a little, bit, a little bit odd. You know, it's like you see a, it's like hearing your voice on a tape sometimes. Um, you, you hear it and you go, oh, that's what I sound like. It's, it feels like that sometimes to look back at the older work. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. You had mentioned to us students that you yeah. had gone to India. So is mm -hmm. that where um, your story derived from, from your own experience? Um, this, this story in, in Thailand um, came from my own experience. In fact, my, um, in fact Larry is in the audience tonight. Um, <clears throat> he's, he, 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 if anyone carrying a rainbow colored burlap bag, he, he still has it. You can, you can identify him with it. Um, it's fairly autobiographical. What I do is I take something that happened to me and I exaggerate it into something more, more dramatic. What happened to me was not really interesting at all. Um, but I was interested in religion. I was having thoughts about what would it be like to attain enlightenment. I was meditating. I was a little bit kooky. Um, but I was very earnest, and I, and I experienced really profound feelings. Um, I would describe them as religious feelings that I still don't know if they were actual or just part of my um, imagination, but they were meaningful to me at the time and, rem and remain so. So I wanted to write about that, but to, to um, find a plot and uh, a story that would accommodate my own experience in a, in a more dramatic fashion. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, you mentioned at some point you decided you wanted to write realer characters less playfully. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you go deeper into the psychology of a character that is not obviously based on autobiography? 
I, it's the creation of character is the hardest thing that I think you can do as a fiction writer. I've, I've often said that how I learned to write was I first learned to write sentences. I just thought about style and, and um, grammar and you know, what a simile would, would be, what make, what's overwriting, what's, what's descriptive, things like that, just sentences. And I read mostly stylists like Nabokov or, or, or Opdyke and thought about language. And the writers I liked were, were fancy writers. Um, then I, with Middlesex, I learned to plot. Um, and uh, it's a very complicated plot. And things are always being set up and then fulfilled and unraveled. And I, I learned to tell a larger story. And as I was doing that, I was learning more about how to, how to do characters. Characters. Um, I, I, it it's be difficult to, to say how I go about it, but I, I, I have to find some correspondence in my own experience with the character I'm writing about. There's a character in this book who's um, a an, an young Indian woman, um, young American woman of Indian descent, and I, you know, I don't really share much um, biographical um, details with her, but I, I do know what it's like to grow up where everyone is speaking a foreign language and I'm not really that interested in learning that language and I'm not interested in, in, in being foreign. I want to become American. I know a lot about what my father went through as a child of immigrants. So there were, there were ways for me to get into her experience. So if I have something like that, if I can find a conduit, then I, then I can be that character. What I do is I try to be the character as an actor would be. I try to imagine what is it like for this one person to live on Earth? What is she like? What is he like? I don't, I don't universalize. I don't think I'm writing about an immigrant experience or I'm, I'm writing about um, Indian Americans. I just think, what is this one person like? She's not like anybody else, and I just have to get that right. And I pretend that I'm, I pretend that I'm her. I did the same thing with Middlesex. I pretended that everything in my life was the same. I have Cal Stefanides being born in Detroit in the same year as me and meet his, the same historical events that I met, grow up at the same time, cultural um, you know, happenings are the same. There's just one difference. He has a genetic mutation that caused him to be born female and then virilize and turn into a boy at, at, at puberty. So if everything can seem like me in some way, I can, I can imagine the person. Um, when I'm writing about characters that are very different than me, I. I tend to base them on a number of people that I know and mush them together. Um, and that's the way. At first, I tried to invent characters out of, out of thin air. Uh, and it didn't, it didn't work very well. I found it to be better if I had a model in mind or best two or three similar people with some differences and, and, and kind of stick them together. And you just, it's like almost building a robot. And then you send it out. And you see, what is it doing? Would it do that? No, it wouldn't do that. It would do this. And you just try different things until what they're saying, how they're acting, how they're looking, begins to feel r real to you. Um, but as I said, it's the, it's the most difficult thing, and I think the, the thing that um, you know, r writers struggle with, and the ones who do it do it well, you know, it's the very most powerful thing you can read. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, my question actually builds on what you just said, which uh -huh. is. I know so many writers rely on their process and when they sit down and how they dive in each day to get, make progress and continue forward. Um, but as you talk about how your writing has evolved, do you feel there's any part where you've really achieved mastery and it's given you confidence and it you know, helps keep you going forward on your projects? I wish that, I wish that was the case. I, I don't, I'm not the, that kind of person. I don't know. Um, how other writers feel, but it's a, it's, um, what did Henry James say? Our, 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 our doubt is our passion and our passion is our task. The rest is the madness of art. You, you usually work in the dark and you're, and you're full of doubt. You don't know how to do it each time and you kind of convince yourself that, that you can do it. You never get a sense that you know what you're doing. And often if you do one thing well, you're tired of doing it, so that with the next book you try something else, and that becomes um, the, the next bar. But you'd be surprised at the level of um, the level of doubt and anxiety um, with which I, I work and operate in a, in a daily way. J John Barth said that writers 
oscillate between overweening arrogance to utter despair. And I, th I think that's true. I and mean, then there's times where you think you, you're really doing it well and you get all fired up, and then times where you think that you really, you know, never should have tried in the, in the first place. So it's, it's difficult. I, um, I uh, try to, I just discuss this with my therapist sometimes. I thought, aren't they, aren't they supposed to be good at this sort of thing, you know? And he always tells me that I have to locate myself, you know, that you have to find myself in it. I'm still not sure what he means. I think he's right, but I'm still figuring, figuring what, what that means. One good thing he, he, he told me, though, is that when the bad feelings come, the doubt, the anxiety, you, you have to just be aware that it's just a thing that's kind of passing through you. It's not you. It's just there. You have to let it inhabit you, and you let it, you let it sort of float away. So I'm, I'm getting better, better at that. He didn't tell me how to keep it from coming at all, unfortunately, which would be useful. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Good evening, sir. Um, it seems more and more these days, novels must begin with absolutely irresistible sentences, otherwise agents won't give them their second due. Uh, in your uh, short story, Baster... That's a very good first sentence, by the way. <laughs> in your short story, Baster, as well as in uh, Middlesex, your sentence, your opening sentences, are irresistible. And that leads me to my question. Uh, were these the original openings, or were these the result of revisions or editorial input? The first sentences of, the first sentence of Middlesex came after a couple of years of, of writing different drafts of, of the book. I, didn't know how to write the book, as I've sort of described. And finally, I, I got a page and a half that contained the DNA for the whole novel. It told me the tone of the book. It told me the plot of the book. It told me what I was dealing with. It told the reader that the book was going to be both realistic and deal with kind of mock epic events as well. And, and when I wrote that first sentence and first page, if anyone compliments it, I say, thanks, it took me two years to, to write it. So it was not at all what came out uh -huh. right away. With The Virgin Suicides, I did get the first paragraph rather quickly after thinking about the story for a long time. Um, there was maybe a year and a half gap between coming up with the idea for the story and then coming up with a voice, this choral narr narrator that I have of, of we. And I did write the first paragraph one day sitting down, and again, it also told me, it was kind of a blueprint for the, for the rest of the book. Um, I had a funny thing happen the other day, I was on a plane, and there was this, um, this, ge this gentleman was talking to someone else ab about a writer, he'd met the writer, um, I won't even say who it is, but he said, oh, this book, he said this is the best line, this is the, the best line in history, it's the best first line in history, here it is. And he looks at the book for a minute, he's quiet, he goes, I don't know if it's such a good first line. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't know what it was, but I guess it's not that good. But thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I have two because one might not even have an answer. And you might oh, be like, I don't okay. know. Okay. Um, but thank you because I really enjoyed your reading. Um, the first question is, what did you spend your first advance on? <laughs> okay. I've been wearing it for 30 years. <laughs> No, actually, we, I, di I did. I bought, a, I bought a, an Armani blazer. There was a, a joke. It was actually written about because I sold my first book at the same time as my college roommate sold his first screenplay. And um, I actually, I bought a Negroni, which is a cocktail, and he bought an Armani. So that they wrote about the fact the difference between literary world and Hollywood was a Negroni to an Armani. Okay, and then the second, that was, yeah. that was way better than I could have expected. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I didn't know it was uh, the second one is, like, do you ever hide anything, like, secrets-wise, in your books that you kind of hope people oh. will find? Um, I guess you didn't come across what I... What I well, I don't know. Maybe I did. <laughs> <laughs> that message that I put in there? you got to look at, the, read the first letter of each word. <laughs> and it all. Or just something that you're, like, thinking is, like, oh, yeah, but you don't know if people are actually going to even think is cool. Not, not like that. Not okay. in a kind of Nobokovian way. I have... Okay. I have things in there, but not, not like that, no. Okay. no. I'll take the first one. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Someone asked this question at a reading that I had come to years uh -huh. ago, 
And I don't remember who the author was, but I remember the answer. And the question was, how do you know when you're done writing? And the answer, the author, at, whoever it was, said, when my publisher shows up at the door and pulls <laughs> mm -hmm. the manuscript out mm -hmm. of my hand and says, you're done. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you the question, how do you know when you're done? Well, that has happened with, with my editor here. <laughs> I was living in Berlin. I thought I was pretty far away, away from his clutches. He did come and, and finally get it away from me. But I, I was telling the students today, I know when I'm finished when everything I'm doing makes it worse. <laughs> you know, because for a while it's getting better, it's getting better, and then suddenly you have these ideas and you start monkeying with it and it just gets worse and worse. Then you know you must be finished, or it is finished, it's as far as you can, can, can take it. So that, that's what I look for. I look for signs of deterioration around the edges, <laughs> and then I know, okay, I better dust it off and hand it in. All right, thank you so thank much you. for coming tonight. I really enjoyed being here. Thank you.